Let me invite you to look with me in Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27. And my text is from verse 12 down to verse 23. And I've entitled this, God's Appointed Joshua. God's Appointed Joshua. I think you can tell where we're going with this. There is an appointed Savior, which is what Joshua means. It's actually the Hebrew form of the word Jesus, which is the Greek. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. It could have very easily been said, Thou shalt call his name Joshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jehovah saves is what Joshua means in the original. Jehovah saves. Let's read this and see how we get this from this portion. In Numbers 27, in verse 12, we read, And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount of Byram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother was gathered. Remember? time back we looked together at Aaron's death and saw it as a type of the priesthood that had to die. Just as here we're going to see it as a type of the law that had to die. The law cannot save. That Old Testament priesthood could not save. They were but types and pictures of the one who saves and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see here the Lord explaining why it was that Moses would not enter into the land. And again, I remind you, unlike so many messages that you hear, Canaan is not a picture of heaven. If it were, then Aaron would not be saved. Moses would not be saved. Uh, Canaan was a type of Christ. He was a, it was a type of rest that is in Christ and a type of the promised rest to those who rest in him. But you'd have to agree, as with myself in this flesh, so often we don't rest. As much as we know and believe concerning Christ's finished work, how many times we find ourselves struggling and striving with what men think we ought to be doing, and with what we've been brought up with, and our consciences are very much alive, now, they're to, they're, the blood has purged us from dead works. There's no question, the blood of Christ. But in ourselves, we, we're still like Moses. We don't enter into that rest, our experience, because we're in this flesh, and we struggle. We, we lay awake at night. We, we think upon things that are so contrary to the gospel. And yet, if our salvation depended upon that, we'd be lost. We'd be lost. Thankfully, it's not. I guarantee you that Moses was not lost <laughs> because he did not enter into the promised land. Two reasons. One, it says here he'd be gathered unto his people. So the Lord was already showing him that this is the way he was pleased to, to bring him to himself uh, and to others that had died before him that were the Lord's. But as we know also from reading in Luke chapter 9, who was it that appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Christ? Well, it was Moses and Elijah. And so, this is important. Yet, verse 14 is significant. For ye rebelled against my commandment in the desert of Zin, in the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. What's he talking about? Well, remember the first time the Lord said, strike the rock. That was a type of Christ. The second time he said, speak to it. And yet, in his anger, he smote it a second time. That was a violation of the type of Christ. How, how many times was Christ smitten? Once. And so, the Lord reminds him here that in that instant, he did not sanctify him, God, at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah and Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. And I pray the Lord keep me faithful to the gospel. You know, it, should I in any way deny the gospel? It doesn't change the truth of the gospel, but men are affected by it. People are. We are to constantly sanctify the Lord God before men's eyes. 
in exalting Christ and upholding him in truth. And I'm aware of that as anybody, how, how weak I am. And that if anybody hears, it's only going to be because God purposed it. But uh, that's what we see here with Moses. In verse 15, Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. Now, I see grace here, because he just told him, you're not going to enter into that promised land. But what was his concern? That people. And that's, that's obviously the concern of a mediator. Lord, if you're taking me out, who is it that you would be pleased to, to raise up? You are the God of the spirits of all flesh. So set a man over the congregation. Again, these men were but fleeting types. But isn't that the prayer as we read from Genesis, from the fall all the way through to, to up to the cross? Where's the man? <laughs> Where's this one to be set over the congregation? We see him in different types and pictures and promises. And, and all of the Old Testament speaks of that one who was to come. And then when we come to the New Testament, we find, behold the man. Behold the Lamb of God. Here he is. Christ, born of a virgin, who lived his life in total obedience to the law, didn't falter in one respect. Even Moses, before he died in Deuteronomy, said the Lord would raise up another prophet like unto him. He wasn't even comparing himself with Christ. He said, like unto me, hear him, hear him. So we see his concern here. And he says, set a man over the congregation which may go out before them and which may go in before them and which may lead them out and which may bring them in. In other words, the whole of their existence depended upon this man, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said unto Moses, take thee Joshua, the son of Nun. You could put in there easily, take thee Jesus. Joshua is that type, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. In other words, may be subject to him, submit to him. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of of Urim before the Lord, at, at his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel, with him even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. You know, I, I realize Joshua is a type, but he's, a, he's probably one of the best types of our Lord Jesus Christ because there's nothing recorded, as far as I've been able to find, with regard to him as an individual of any sort of faltering. The law couldn't save. But Joshua, you, you read Joshua's life, I, I don't find anything written in this inspired word that you could point to and said he failed here. He did all that the Lord commanded. And I know he was a sinner, just like any of us. But as far as the recorded word, he served as the best type that you could have with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ and his work and ministry. It says here, Moses laid his hands, verse 23, on him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. All right, so we have here, in these verses, the Lord forewarning Moses of his death and preparing him for it. And really, dear friends, this is something of which we also are warned in Scripture and must ultimately face. We're not reading things here that just, you know, are historic and somehow don't pertain to us. Every one of us sitting here right now is facing the same situation. It's just that the Lord hasn't been pleased to tell us when and how. But nonetheless, we face this inevitable event called death. Young or old, it is the Lord who determines not only the time and manner of our birth, but also of our death. I hope we're mindful of that. With regard to our birth, 
I know that growing up, you know, as kids, we always had certain things we didn't like about ourselves. In fact, there's an awful lot in, in my old age that I don't like about myself. But I'll tell you, I know this, everything about me and everything about you, your color of your hair, the color of your eyes, your, the height. I used to hate my curly hair, you know, just uh, my senior picture in high school. You look at it, it it's, you wonder, how did he get his hair so straight? Well, I washed it the night before and I put on a snow cap and slept in it so that when my senior picture came out, my hair would be straight. <laughs> That's how much I hated my curly hair. And you look at that senior, I look at it then and think, what a fool, you know? That's not even me, but it was slick, it was straight. Those are things that after a while you learn that, you know, the Lord, the Lord ordained it. He, he, it's exactly, we're exactly the way we are because the Lord has made us so. If you look over in Psalm 139 and verses 13 through 16, kids are can be mean. They like to point out things about you, their defects and everything. And then, of course, you always come back with sticks and stone. They break my bones and names will never harm me, you know, but you're really hurt. And you, you know, you'd really like to say something back, but you know better, or sometimes you do. These kinds of things, you know, are, are a result of discontent about the way that the Lord has made us. In reality, every one of us is in that way because that's exactly how the Lord purposed us to be. And the sooner we can learn that and rest in it, the better we're going to get along with it. But here in Psalm 139, in verse 13, David acknowledged it. He said, for thou hast possessed my reins. What are the reins? Those are the very, those are the hidden, the deepest, whatever the deepest part of your being is, is what the scripture calls your reins. The Lord's possessed it. It's his. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. If I didn't have any other verse in scripture to show that abortion is murder. You know, they always talk about these things was just a fetus. They almost talk about it as if it's an impersonal thing. And yet here, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. All right. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. There's an awful lot about David. Probably if he's a man like we are, and he was. There's probably an awful lot of, of things that he didn't like about himself. And yet he says, I am brought to see how fearfully and wonderfully made I am. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee. All right? When I was made in secret, he's talking about conception, when, when that seed was first conceived, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, in other words, immature, not yet fully formed. But you see, it's all personal language. And thou did see my substance, me, I. All right, that, that, that fetus cannot speak for itself, and yet it is very, every bit a creation of God. And in thy book, all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned. In other words, as, as, as that fetus developed in the womb, it continued to be fashioned, but it was being fashioned by God's hand. When as yet there was none of them. All right, and then he says, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me. He's talking about God's thoughts toward his elect, his own. That's who David was. Even as that babe in that womb, God, God, God's hand was upon him. God saw him. He saw him from eternity. But now as this birth came forth, as this, as this motion toward his birth came forth, he's recognizing that even there, God's thought was toward him. And he would bring him out and in time reveal his son in him and cause him to look to Christ who would come and die for his sin. And he says, oh, how great is the sum of them. He's not talking about his thoughts toward God. He's talking about God's thought toward him. So you see, in every aspect, our birth is determined of the Lord, but so is our death. If you look over in 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verses 6 through 8, you see, this is why I believe it, the Lord gives grace when it's, when it's needed. You know, Moses' attitude, as the Lord showed him that he would not enter in, that we don't see a 
a struggle, although we do read in Deuteronomy where he did ask the Lord for uh, mercy, and the Lord said, don't, don't speak to me anymore about it. It's the way it's going to be. I think that's pretty much how we do in dealing with things that come our way. There's a, there's a crying out to the Lord, but then when it becomes evident it's not going to change, he brings you to bow. He brings you to bow. And there's a reason, as the Lord teaches you, because here even Hannah, in her prayer, you see in verse 6, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. Now we know that's true spiritually. And that's what he's done for us. But it's also true in our everyday lives, our promotions and demotions, <laughs> our successes and our failures, as we call it. Those are all of the Lord. But if he's pleased to bless, he gets all the glory. To set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. All right? So what are some lessons then, coming back to Numbers chapter 27, what are some lessons that we can learn from this announcement of Moses' death? And then secondly, how is Joshua named and appointed as Moses' successor, a type of our Lord Jesus Christ? Those are the two thoughts I want you to consider with me just in a few moments here. But in, in Numbers 27, in verses 12 through 14, we, we see here how God shows Moses, again, his fault for you know, speaking unadvisedly with his lips at the waters of strife and didn't do what he should have done, that he was angry, and he, he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. What was at stake there? Well, it was the honor and glory of, of his son. And here's a chastening, and again, that there's a reminder of what is most precious to God. It's not necessarily us. <laughs> now, I know we're precious in his sight, but only in Christ. What is vital to God is the honor and glory of his son. And that's how he blesses. If we have any blessing at all, it'll be because of his son. And if we are as disobedient children in our thoughts and minds, prone to go another way, the, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. So that's what we need to see here, this chastening of the Lord. I know this, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what we did in Adam. When he sinned, we sinned. But I know this as well, that if we're saved, it's not because of any perfection in us. It's because of the perfection of his son. And that's what that rock was set there, created and placed there in that wilderness to signify at that time. But Moses missed it. He missed it. He, he missed the glory of Christ in that moment. And so the Lord used it as an example to everybody not to take these things lightly. You know, we, we make far too many excuses for ourselves and for others, preachers, who missed the glory of Christ. This ought to be the upper moment, not, oh no, did I say a wrong word today, or, you know, oh no, did I speed, or oh no, did I, all these things that preoccupy your mind. You know, we're to live as civil citizens of this world, no question. But I'll tell you this, what's uppermost in God's purpose in mind is glorifying His Son. In word and thought, giving Him all the glory in His person and in his work finished at Calvary for his own. So you see, that's why this verse 14, it's, it's a rebellion. It's a rebellion. It's subtle. We think, well, I slipped up. No, it's a rebellion. <laughs> that's why, you know, even myself, the Lord obviously hadn't struck me dead, but there's times I come away after preaching, and it's not until I get home and sit down and start thinking again about the portion of Scripture that the Lord will give you the, the understanding of what you missed with regard to the, his son. You preached, you preached around it, you got close to it, but it was not, wasn't nailed. And those are times when you come back, you just, it's better to come back the next week and say, look, let's go back and look at this one more time and see how this pertains to the glory of Christ, rather than just saying, oh, well, we all mess up every once in a while. And I would that God would give us all such an earnest, 
to the glory of Christ that in every portion of scripture, every time we open our mouths to speak, that we point sinners to this one, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his glory, because that's glory is. But here in verse 12, just coming back in verse 12, even though Moses' death was a chastening for this sin, yet I find here the Lord encouraging him with a glimpse of the promised land. See, this is where in love he's being chastened. That's what I see here, in love. That's how the Lord deals with his children. Even at a ripe old age of 120, which is what Moses was about this time, getting close to it, the Lord preserved his eyes. You know, in Deuteronomy it says when he died, his eyesight was still good. <laughs> I liken that to, to one to whom the Lord has given spiritual eyes. His body was weak. His body was feeble. You know, if there's one thing that I pray that as I grow older, that the Lord would enable me by his grace to continue to seek Christ as my only hope. As the Lord was chastening Moses here, yet he preserved his eyes to be able to stand and behold from a distance the inheritance and the heritage of Israel as his chosen people. I believe this is a, this is a, a blessing and a comfort to any of us who are the Lord's chosen, that he has redeemed, has redeemed Israel. You know, we have to die. We must die. You're not going to escape it. Not a one in this room is going to escape it. Anyone hear me? But we do so with the hope of the promise having been fulfilled in Christ and looking to him as our rest. That's what that Canaan represents. He could see that what the Lord promised he would do. Now for Moses, it was still a looking forward. God did not intend with this sight to tantalize him. He wasn't trying to hang a carrot out in front of him and hold it over him and say, see Moses what you missed? As if somehow it was conditioned on him. It was really a way of showing him to comfort him that it would be his in another way when Christ came and, and accomplished it for him. And that even though he did not enter into that physical land, yet the promise was still his and the inheritance was still his and would be when Christ would come and pay his debt and put away even that sin of rebellion and unbelief. I believe that's, that's the purpose here. God was not upbraiding him with his folly. He didn't drag this out with Moses and try to just rub it in. No, he brought him there and stood and showed him that even he as a type could not bring to pass what God had purposed for him, but God would do it. God would do it through his son. And so I, I find here that God is appointing this, standing here and looking on that land as a favor upon him and a wonderful strengthening of him. You know, that's the way it was for all those Old Testament saints. If you go over and look in Hebrews chapter 13, a lot of people ask me all the time, what's the difference between the hope of those in the Old Testament and our hope? Well, as far as the object of their hope and ours, if we're the Lord's, it's the same. They simply look forward to what God had promised. And that's what that promised land represents. They look forward to this one who would come, live, and die in obedience to God's law and justice and satisfy it by his death, the Lord Jesus Christ. They look forward to that. What do we do? We look back to it. But it's the same object of hope. And that's what we see here in Hebrews chapter 13. If, if you've never underscored uh, this verse, uh, perhaps you ought to do so. It's not Hebrews 13. It's actually Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. And verse 39. This whole chapter of Hebrews 11 you know, it speaks of through faith. And as it was brought out in our Bibles, we could really say through Christ. Because that's who the object of faith is. Through Christ, they passed through the Red Sea. Through Christ, the walls of Jericho fell down. Through Christ, the harlot Rahab perished not. It was because of Christ. Here in verse 39, it says, and these all, you could just keep going. It doesn't list exhaustively all that were the elect of the Lord there, but these all, having obtained a good report, again, through Christ. It wasn't through their believing, but through that faith that the Lord had revealed to them. 
It says, receive not the promise. They never saw Christ come in the flesh as, as had been promised. And yet, it says, God having provided some better thing for us, look at this, that they without us should not be made perfect or complete is what that word is. When were we all made complete? Because it talks about one time. Well, we're made complete at the cross. Ye are complete in him, is what the scripture says. And at one instant, all of the sins of all of God's elect was charged to Christ when he died. And in that same event, all of God's righteousness was imputed, charged to the account of the Lord's people, Moses included. When was Moses justified? Same time I was. Same place in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's true of any that are the Lord's. So you can see this is not a, you know, a way of holding this over Moses' head, but it's, it's a way of getting him to look to the promises that are in Christ. But we know, in, according to verse 13, that death is not an end. It's not an end. You know, it's, uh, it's not a cutting off as is used to describe the, the unregenerate wicked when they die. There is a cutting off. There's no mercy. There's no grace. And they, they have nothing but the judgment of God that awaits them, eternal judgment. But here, you see his death is described as a gathering to his people. See that in verse 13, thou shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. There is a, you know, death precious in the sight of the Lord of the death of his sons. There's a gathering unto Christ around his throne of his, of his people. And that gathering, again, is based upon the promise of God at that time to redeem and justify him at the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why when he appeared, if you look over in Luke 9 and verse 31, when he appeared on that Mount of Transfiguration, you can see what he and Elijah were talking about. Moses representing there the law, Elijah the prophets. So again, all of Old Testament scripture. And it says, who appeared in glory. So right there it shows where they were, in glory. And spake of his decease, which he should accomplish. And notice it doesn't just say accomplish, but where? At Jerusalem. Where was, where was salvation accomplished? Where was sin put away? Where were the sacrifices of the Old Testament ended? Where was the veil rent in twain? You see, where was this whole, all of these types and pictures, where did they end? At Jerusalem, at the cross. You see, and that's where sin was put away. That's where the Lord's people were redeemed at one time. And that's where they were all justified together. You see, so that's the hope of the Lord's children in the face of death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So here's an encouragement for us to think about death for the Lord's. Think about death without terror. Now, I know there's some that have no knowledge of Christ that kind of face death stoically. You, you know them, I know them. They, they have no interest in Christ, and yet they don't fear death. You know, fear of death is not necessarily an indication that you don't know the Lord. We're in this flesh, and I'm going to face it when that time comes, if the, unless the Lord just takes me out. But we all struggle with this flesh. I know some that it seems that they were the Lord's, and yet they, they struggled with death. They struggled all the way through it. On the other hand, I've known some that had no interest in Christ whatsoever that faced it, you know, without a, without a flinch. That's ignorant. That's blatant blindness, not knowing what, what awaits them. But we have every encouragement here as the Lord's people to, to face it with peace, with comfort, knowing that to be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Now, verses 15 to 23, here's where Moses is concerned about a successor and prays that God would raise him up. You know, his concern over a successor, uh, we, we can understand that. I, I believe it's on our minds as far as heads of families and taking care of business, uh, not to leave people in a, loved ones that we have in a desperate state I think about as a pastor of a church, I, you know, you selfishly pray, Lord, don't, don't just remove me unless you've got somebody that's going to carry on preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in all of this, it's the Lord's. It's his time, and it's what he's purposed to do. These are in his hand, 
and we're brought to know that none of us is indispensable, particularly myself. None of us is indispensable. I live by God's grace and mercy. Every breath I take is, is exactly what he gives. And if he's pleased to take me out tomorrow, he'll, he'll provide for his sheep. I'm not the shepherd. <laughs> I'm not the shepherd. Christ is. Christ will care for his own. And the Lord will take care of them. But that was Moses' concern. You see here in verse 17, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. He as a type had to go away. Moses had to go away. The law could not bring salvation. That's why he had to go away and Joshua, of Joshua had to be raised up. And that's who Moses had in mind here. And I believe that's the greater message here of Moses as a type of the law. Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law cannot save, only Christ who has come, lived and died and brought satisfaction can save. So that's indicated over here in John chapter one. I want you to see that in John chapter one. There's a lot of other verses in the New Testament we could look at, but I'll just give this for you to chew on. In John chapter one and verse 17, well, John bear record of him. You know, everybody was flocking after John the Baptist and he said, I'm not the light. I'm not that one who was to come. I'm a forerunner. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. Would that any servant of the Lord would continue to say that. He must increase. I must decrease. For he was before me. He was before me in preeminence. He was before me in time. He was before me in type and picture and promise. <laughs> he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. So that's the only way that grace is given is through this one. But now look at verse 17. For the law was given by Moses. But you notice but is in italics. The law was given by Moses. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I don't think that it's contrasting Christ with Moses. I believe it's showing Moses to be a complement to Christ in this that the law was given by him but that law had to be satisfied and so Christ has come and satisfied it both by grace and truth and here you can go back to Psalm 85 in order for God to be the just justifier of sinners that he purposed to say law and justice had to be satisfied grace and truth had to meet together mercy could not be at the expense of justice that's what it's talking about. And if he had no other verse but that, to know that that's why Christ came, in fulfillment of what Moses knew and was, was revealed in him and what he typified. But he had to go away. Moses had to go away. There was no salvation in him, just as there's no salvation in anybody going back to those Ten Commandments or going back to the ceremonies or trying to think like uh, one of those philosophers did and writing on the city of God, if we could just kind of form a colony somewhere where we'll just apply all the principles of the Bible and scripture. There's a bunch of people around the world like that. You find them in little camps and colonies isolated from the real world. They get inbred in their religion because they think that they're pure by isolating themselves. And their thinking is Israel may have failed, Moses may have failed, but I'm not going to fail. And so what do they do? They keep going back to the law as if somehow they can work out a, a righteousness based on that. It can't be done. That's why Christ came. That's why Paul wrote in Galatians 2.21, if righteousness come by law, if there was a law, if there was an order, if there was a rule, if there was a practice or a ceremony that somebody could keep that could truly bring in righteousness, what does it say? Christ is dead in vain. You're smiting that, that rock one more time. You're saying that's not the way it's going to be done. And you've made the work of Christ of none effect. Well, there's a lot here, but if you come back here, all the qualifications of Joshua with respect to natural Israel, if you look at these qualifications of Joshua, and we're going we're gonna to see this more as we go on, as we move into Joshua's era, but all of those qualifications, I believe, are designed to symbolize the Lord Jesus, who is God's appointed Joshua. Let me just give you a, a couple of ways of seeing this, and then I'll be done. Verse 17 in uh, Numbers 27, what does it say there? That he might go out before them 
and which may go in before them and which may lead them out. And it says there, and be the, that the congregation be not as sheep with no shepherd. Where does that take your mind? John chapter 10. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. So that's who Joshua typifies. And then in verse 18, he's described as one in whom was the spirit of God and God's hand was laid on him. That's what the word Christ means, the anointed. And you can read that in Isaiah 42, 1 through 4, how the spirit of God was upon him and in him, in a, in a, without measure, you see, to accomplish his will. Verse 20, where it talks there about putting some of thine or Moses' honor upon him. And that kind of stumped me a little bit. How was this honor going to be put upon Joshua? Well, the honor of the law was placed upon Christ. That's what Moses represents, the law. He magnified the law. He upheld it. He did what Moses could not do, you see. And so even that, we see a type of Christ. In verse 21, he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him, and at his word shall they go out and come in. Christ is that great high priest. In Joshua, there was a, a direct connection between Christ as the Savior and his work as the high priest. Here in the Old Testament, there were two separate people, Joshua and Eleazar, but in Christ they're one. He's prophet, priest, and king. And then verse 22, Moses did as the Lord commanded him in setting up Joshua as his successor. That's what the law was given to do. It was there until Christ should come. In Christ being come, the law has been put away. It's been done away. It is no more for those that are the Lord's. All right. Well, I pray the Lord will. We'll bless that to our hearing and understanding. Let's have a word of prayer, and then Brother Jim's going to come and lead us in a final hymn. Our gracious Father, I do thank you for your word, and there's just so much more there than what our minds are able to get around. But I'm thankful that in your time you do teach us. And I pray that you will continue to do so. Open up this book, uh, particularly some of these portions that have been closed to our hearts and minds for so long, and yet it is your word, and it does point us to Christ. And I pray that you would continue to teach us by your grace and mercy. And we give you the praise in this blessed name. Amen.